Hey, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. I'm here with one of my favorite people, Dr. Mark Feldman, originally in, a New Yorker, uh, now living in Adelaide. Uh, who knows why, but you know, um, I'm sure that Australia and America aren't that much culturally um, incompatible. I, I met Mark 20 years ago, maybe even more, and he was into activator methods and I was learning the technique, etc. Uh, we also cross paths on many different levels, politics and uh, education in this beautiful country. And uh, Mark worked at New York Chiropractic College as a, uh, was it adjunct professor, Mark, or professor? Uh, I, was, I was a full-time associate professor. Right. Uh, CQU University program and currently with the Australian Chiropractic College. He's also one of the most advanced um, uh, uh, masters in activate a methods chiropractic technique, probably in the world, uh, certainly in Australia. His interest has always been business. He, he's a very well-rounded individual, but when you want to talk about the business of chiropractic, here we go, Dr. Mark. Well, thank you, Joe, and, and thanks for inviting me to be a guest here with you today. Um, not knowing, you know, your audience will be a very diverse group, and so I want to throw the, the cat amongst the pigeons straight away and just say chiropractic practice is a business. And if people treat it as anything other than that, they're doomed to fail. Okay. And I will then, as that is my opening comment, Joe, I'm going to leave it open to you to direct the conversation any way you want to go. You know, I have some very strong uh, opinions and about the business of chiropractic, you know that they are very ethically based, and you know that anything that I say, I have actually done. So where you just made a bold statement, I need you to expand on that. Um, if you don't treat chiropractic as a business, you're doomed to fail. Is that it? Correct. Okay. What are the main failure points around that, Mark? Okay. Uh, I tend to think that right now... Um, we are producing a great number of graduates, uh, and I can only now speak about Australia. I've been here for 24 years now. For the past 24 years, I've lived in Australia. So I'm gonna speak uh, about the Australian landscape. Now with all my colleagues in the States, I'm hearing the same story from the United States, mm -hmm. is that we're producing a number of graduates now who uh, have limited value to chiropractic employers. We have a, a horrific problem in chiropractic right now. It's the dirty little secret, but it's really the giant dirty little secret that nobody wants to talk about. And that is we have gross underemployment of new graduates. In other words, new graduates are A, either not finding employment situations and arrangements, or B, they have found some sort of an employment arrangement, but they need more work than they're currently receiving. Mm. See, chiropractic, like anything else, it, our industry, it, it's a business. And, you know, I know that a lot of people want to think about us as, well, we're healthcare, so, so we're different. Everybody I know that has been successful in business has done so with very sound business principles. They have done so with hard work. I've never seen anybody luck their way into anything. Yeah. Right. And usually those, you know, when people look at successful chiropractors, oh, this guy is so lucky. This woman is so lucky. Yeah. And if you sat down and spoke to them, you'd find out that the harder they work, the luckier they seem to get. You know, everything has to be built, A, on hard work. And B, I think that we, we graduate a lot of students now that don't really have a, a direction. Um, if I can borrow a, a little bit from some of the other uh, authors and speakers that are out there. Our new graduates are, are, don't get me wrong, they're extremely well-trained in the application of chiropractic procedures. They are extremely well-trained well in basic core sciences, extremely well-trained in, in the current literature, extremely well-trained in how to practice safe chiropractic. What they are not well trained in is how to take that skill, that knowledge base, 
combine it with a soft skill set to become a profitable practitioner. And when we speak about the soft skills, communication skills, business skills, financial knowledge, networking capabilities, these are the soft skills. You see, the hard skills, that's our, you know, our diagnostic, our, our assessments, our technique applications and, and all the other ancillary procedures, those are the hard skills of being a chiropractor. And we're producing now in, in just about every country that I look at, we're producing very capable new graduates. Technically, they're very good, but, but where they're dropping the ball is they haven't, they haven't added or integrated or synthesized those soft skills. Look, good skills make good doctors. Good hard skills, let me rephrase that. Good hard skills make good doctors. Yeah. Good soft skills make successful doctors. Mm. So soft skills? Yeah. So you know, essentially how we manage people with our communication skills, how we manage our business, how we manage our finances. Um, there is this this perception now that all one really needs to do is to graduate, say that I'm a chiropractor and the world owes them a living. Mm -hmm. The world owes you nothing. And that's exactly what you're going to get. We all have to go out and, and make a career for ourselves. You see, careers need to be planned and successful careers need to be planned meticulously. Um, I tell my personal story, you know, people always say personal stories have, have impact. Mm. I was a, a first semester student at New York Chiropractic College in September of 1981, you know, sometime just after the fall of Rome. And, uh, and I remember, you know, I used to go to seminars. This was in my first semester of chiropractic school. And I used to go to a lot of seminars as mm. students do or did in those days. And I used to look around the room and see really successful chiropractors. And without them knowing it, I adopted them as role models and mentors. I looked at them, I studied them, I paid attention to them, and I knew that I wanted to be like those people. And so what I did was I created, you know, I began with the end in mind. I created that image, that persona, who that person was, what, and I reverse engineered that. So here I am in my first semester of chiropractic school. I looked at these very successful chiropractors. I looked at their common traits. And then I said, okay, let me reverse engineer that back to where I am as a, a brand new neophyte, a chiroblast, right? Some uh, undifferentiated cell that's going to become a chiropractor later. And what steps, what milestones do I need to achieve to get to that destination? What skills do I need to learn? What networking do I need to do? What knowledge do I need to gain? What ancillary soft skill? What do I need to learn about business? What do I need to learn about finance? What technique do I need to master? See, here's one of the other things that I see with new graduates. They are jacks of all trades, hence masters of none. And I know that in a lot of our, our chiropractic training programs, we've done away with the old conventional technique systems, you know, like some of the, the real foundational systems. We had the Gonstead, which is a system of analysis, adjustment, and post-analysis. So, you know, things like Gonstead, things like the Thompson system, things like Activator, things like SOT, you know, these were really well put together systems that had a comprehensive analysis. They had a very specific way of doing things. There was almost this flow chart that you followed to, to work your way through delivering adjustments. And when I went to school, we learned all these named techniques, you know, or technique systems, I call them, because they're all yeah. quite comprehensive. And what happens is the, the students of today now are learning a, um, a more generalized version of chiropractic. One of the things I always tell the students is expose yourself to a number of these technique systems, find the one that really resonates with you. And then if you want to be a master chiropractor, Step one, you must master your chosen technique system. Yeah. See, for me, I, I graduated in 1984. 
I never saw Activator until 1995. I was I was I was 11 years out of school until I I was introduced to Activator methods, and then once I was introduced to Activator methods, I was like, bang! You know, the light globe went on. I was like, wow! I get this. This this explains a lot of things for me. This ties it all together. And then once I started to practice Activator methods, you know, everything just got enormous for me. Um, because I, I selected a technique system and committed myself to mastering it, which was attending as many seminars as possible, purchasing all in those days, it was the videotapes and the audio tapes, going to every seminar, doing everything I could to master it, to become uh, first like an advanced practitioner, you know, with some qualification, then to be invited to be an assistant instructor, and then a, you know, a platform instructor, and then, you know, a senior instructor, and, you know, to just totally commit myself to that, that technique system, mm -hmm. you know, rather than, okay, I tried this trick, it's not working, I tried that trick, it's not working, you know, how many different things am I going to try uh, until I find something that works? And so I, I would share with students if they could expose themselves to technique systems that have stood the test of time. You know, we, we hear in academia, well, where's the evidence for this and where's the evidence for that? Well, you know, we're holding ourselves to a very high standard of evidence right now. But, you know, you look at some of these systems that have been in use quite successfully, nonstop for several decades, producing clinical results. You know, they, everyone knew gravity existed, but it took thousands of years till someone could explain it. Yeah. And so I guess the thing is, you know, the, the, the students need to have things it, it, they're trained to to question and that's a good thing but they're trained don't accept anything unless you have you know these double blind studies and you know gold standard evidence and, and all this well the, the bottom line is you know all of the the research that's done in medicine is funded by big pharma yeah. they spend billions i mean they just spend billions and billions a year just on advertising yeah. right yeah. chiropractic research is funded by chiropractors yeah, sadly. So. And so here goes another one of my axioms that I always use. Affluence buys influence. Mm. And so if chiropractors and, and, and the profession as a whole is not developing and maintaining affluence, we're never going to be able to purchase any influence. You know, I remember back in the 1980s, I was always amazed that, you know, in the United States, or I grew up and was educated and, and spent, you know, a lot of my adult life. Um, we had 50 different states, each with its own chiropractic jurisdiction, its own scope of practice, its own licensing, or what we refer to as registration here in Australia. And you looked at the states that had the, the most liberal or comprehensive laws for chiropractors. These were states where chiropractors were affluent and they were taking a lot of that money and plowing it back into the profession, back into the political, the political um, arms of the profession because affluence purchases influence. So, you know, I, and I just, without mentioning names, it was only about two hours ago, I was in another meeting with um, a representative of the national organization. I'll just leave it as that. Sure. And this very topic came up in the conversation. And, and I was trying to explain, just using some simple numbers, if we have 6,000 chiropractors in Australia, which we do, yeah. and if each one of those had a modicum of affluence such that they could donate thousand dollars a year to some sort of chiropractic political action committee. Six thousand chiropractors times a thousand dollars a year is a six million dollar war chest. Imagine some of the influence that we could now purchase with six million dollars a year. Mm. And of course there are those who could certainly cough up a lot more money than that. Yes. Because influence is purchased by affluence. Yeah. And 
we had um, in, in our generation of chiropractor, what I witnessed, what I observed, I have no evidence to support any of this. I'm just going with my observations 24 years in Australia. The older generation of chiropractor, the one that you and I belong to, mm -hmm. had achieved better affluence than the newer generation of chiropractor is, is currently achieving. Mm -hmm. Our generation was not grossly underemployed. Our generation were business owners. Ah, here's another Feldmanism, if you want, in business. The, the pathway to ethical affluence in chiropractic, that pathway is through business ownership. See, we're generating, we're producing now, we're graduating a whole generation of chiropractors that would like to be full-time employees with all the benefits that come along, the retirement benefits, superannuation, it's known in this country, with a long service leave, with sick leave, with paid holidays, with all this stuff, you know, as if they were working in, in the private sector for some other company, yeah. or even in the public sector. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's okay. But what I witness and what I observe in, in business is that employees never become wealthy. Yes. Employees may have job security, but they don't become wealthy. Wealth is built through business ownership. And in chiropractic, Every single chiropractor in this country, in fact, worldwide, has the opportunity to achieve business ownership. A lot of people don't want to do it because, oh, it's too hard. Oh, it's too risky. Oh, it's too... Basically, what you're saying is, I don't want to put in the time to get the reward. I would just like someone to guarantee me the reward without me having to put in all that hard work that I see. You know, we... I see new graduates and they look at successful practitioners and they want to duplicate the lifestyle that person has. But what they may not understand or appreciate is that person made huge sacrifices. You know, I've had a number of, 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 of associates that, that worked for me because as we know in, in Australia, if you're their only employer, they are actually employees of yours, you know, based on the way the laws are set up. We, we really can't employ them as independent contractors that, you know, the regulations are kind of strict. And what it comes down to is that when you're working for yourself, you work a lot harder than when you're working for someone else. You know, some people go to work for their paycheck and other people go to work for the company. Yeah. And, and so I think that, that the work ethic is kind of different. Um, I reckon if you had to do away with all employment arrangements and every chiropractor was to be given a percentage of the work they generate, I think they might work harder. Mm, true. And, and, and jumping into tertiary chiropractic education, uh, this, is the, this is the terrible question. Um, or, or worldwide, how many colleges do you know that have this business acumen training well here's what's really interesting you know like everything in life especially if you look at politics right politics economics there's a pendulum mm. so you know like uh social mores you know there's this pendulum like mm -hmm. politically if things get too conservative then governments change and they swing back to you know swings back to the left then it gets too far to the left it swings back to the right in in finance and business and economics, you know, things go up and then they go down and then they go up and then, you know, things never keep going up forever and things never stay down forever. Mm. And so what we're now starting to see in a number of the chiropractic colleges or programs, I'll say around the world is there's a recognition that, hey, we want to produce successful graduates. Now, there are a number of motivations for that. I mean, actually, you know, uh, affluent alumni become donors. Yes. Starving alumni don't become donors. So if I was running a chiropractic program, I'd want my alumni to be successful. And then I'd go back and remind them that that success came from what we taught them and that they should be appreciative of that and give some money back. Yeah. Right. I've always given money back. Um, so we're starting to see now some of the chiropractic programs are bringing in 
business programs. And some of them I see are very good and some of them I see are not very good. You know, um, teaching people the business of chiropractic goes a lot. It has to be a lot deeper than downloading a PDF of a business plan and saying, here, this is how we do a business plan. You know, you have to question a couple of things in teaching these business programs that, you know, a lot of the chiropractic tools, hey, we're teaching that we're, te we're teaching them this we're teaching them that. Well, the questions you have to ask is a who's teaching it? What are their credentials B? Where are they getting their content from? And C, what's their delivery look like? Mm. You know, to say that, yes, this is in the curriculum is different than saying we're teaching and the students are receiving this version of education. Because if they're all receiving that, then why aren't we seeing that show up in the financial uh, snapshot of chiropractic five years later. Why is it that five years after graduation, if you're teaching all of this, five years after graduation, such a, 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 a high percentage of chiropractic graduates are not even in the profession anymore? Do you know what that figure is of attrition? Uh, well, it depends on the country. It depends on the different chiropractic schools. What I have heard bounced around here in Australia is that it's somewhere between 30 and 50 percent. Now, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, I've heard the same number about physiotherapy. I've heard the same number about medicine. medicine. I've heard the same number about dentistry. Yeah. So it may be a natural phenomenon. It, it may be. And look, the other thing is interesting story and, and you know back here's what i've been told and I, I obviously wasn't around for it so i couldn't tell you back in the old days and i mean the old days when you applied <laughs> to dental school dental dental school and chiropractic school are similar in that you take people who are basically intelligent people and teach them manual dexterity or procedures that that rely on manual dexterity mm -hmm. And what they used to do in dental school back in the dark ages is at the end of your interview, because, you know, you have to interview to go to the school, they would give you a, a bar of soap and a whittling knife. Yeah. And they would show you a three-dimensional object and said, carve that piece of soap so it looks like that object. And so you got to see how people worked with their hands. You know, I can tell you as a uh, chiropractic instructor, and in fact, someone who, who was a, a technique instructor for many years in manual techniques, mm. we had students coming to chiropractic school that were incredibly bright people in high school, very high grades, very high grades at university coming out of chiropractic school. They never had a pair of hands. And so if we're teaching them a, a, a chiropractic a uh, system that is basically based upon manual dexterity. So it's static palpation, motion palpation, leg checks, you know, all, and, and then actual adjusting procedures where we have to thrust into different areas of the spine, controlling our velocity, controlling our amplitude, you know, controlling a number of things. If all of those things are important, then there should be some way, somehow, some, some means of evaluating people before they get there. Now, I know if you talk to every chiropractic program, they're going to defend themselves and say, well, we sure. teach courses in, in how to develop and how to enhance your psychomotor skills. But again, you got to go back to what's the course content? Who's delivering the content? What's their delivery look like? And what are their credentials? Yeah. I guess one of the other big things I see with chiropractic education is, you know, when I went to school, we had um, a faculty that were primarily practicing chiropractors who came in and basically volunteered four hours a week to teach at a chiropractic school. Yeah. You know, they made their living in practice, you know, whereas now what we see is there, there are a large number of chiropractic faculty who have not made their living in practice, mm -hmm. although they all they all tend to claim that they have. Yeah. So um, do you see that sticking with business, because that's your thing, um, do you think that business acumen is best delivered in a chiropractic school by chiropractors? And if not, what kind of outside non-chiropractic training would you 
um, recommend. <clears throat> Obviously, a successful chiropractor is what we want to emulate, but what outside of chiropractic business-wise, because I know you look at everything, um, uh, what, would, uh, what would benefit students out of non-chiropractic as well? In, in well, I th uh, okay, and, and I think, and you know, um, gee, I don't know if I should say this, but I might as well go, hey, oh, look, you know, I, I tend to piss off people every time I open my mouth, so why should this, this occasion be any different? <laughs> um, uh, the current chiropractic program that I work with uh, has asked me to, to take on and design their business courses. So I'm like, okay, great. So I'm going to bring in accountants to talk to people about taxation and business structure. I'm going to bring in super, uh, you know, superannuation specialists to talk to them about retirement, retirement planning, those sorts of things. Um, you know, you have, if, if, if you don't know where you go, if you get you there. So I would much rather see chiropractic students knowing what the financial requirements are to be successful. I would be bringing in people who specialize in lending so that students can now know, okay, I'm going to need to borrow money to purchase a business, to purchase equipment, to, to do these sorts of things. What is a lender looking for so I can start to structure my financial life the right way to begin with. I'd be bringing in insurance people to speak about, look, here are the different kinds of insurance and here are the things, here are the benefits of having this and here's what happens if you get caught with your pants around your ankles and you don't have it. Mm. And so I, I'm, I'd be bringing those people in. I would also be bringing in successful chiropractors who can say now, look, there are basic principles in business that can be taught by business people. Then there are those basic business principles that are germane to a successful chiropractic business that can be taught by people that have actually done it. You see, I think that, you know, if you don't play the game, you shouldn't make the rules. I, you know, growing up in America, I never played cricket, never saw the game till I got to Australia. I'm obviously not the guy who should be coaching you in cricket. Mm. Nor yeah. should I be any sort of an official in cricket because I don't know a damn thing about it. Yeah, but yeah, what you say is uh, paramount that, that different professionals are required. It's a business is a multifaceted thing. Ultimately, we want to hear from the successful chiropractor. But um, uh, what about other areas that you? Um, we can talk more about the structure of business education or. Um, your crystal ball and forecast, your, you, you, you don't practice anymore, but you have so much to offer and you, you are, which is great. So you've got a lot of, you know, you've got a few years left of influence. What do you, what do you see the future bringing? What are your fears of the future? Uh, obviously, you know, failure in business is, is, is catastrophic to the, to the profession, as you said, it's a major point, but, what do you see as um, other areas of future growth or threat? Okay. I believe, based on what I'm observing, my, my gut tells me that if we don't change course in chiropractic, and, and changing course means we, we need to change course in our educational system. Um, I believe it's the, 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 the industry should be telling academia, here's what we need in a graduate, supply us with this, please. What we have going on now is academia telling industry, here's what you need, so we're giving it to you. Mm -hmm. Now, if that trend continues, I see chiropractic, um, when, when the current generations start moving on, I don't see a whole new group of, of younger chiropractic entrepreneurs taking over these businesses. I think we're going to have a lot of currently successful practitioners that may not be able to pass on their practices through through you know a transitional business sale because um, I don't think there's going to be a, a demand by those many buyers. I also think that the new generation of chiropractor coming out will never achieve the kind of affluence that has been achieved previously by our generation and those before us. 
I see chiropractors, again, if they cannot, if, if as a profession, we cannot purchase political influence, and that comes from affluence. Affluence creates influence. Without developing that affluence as a profession, we're not going to have that influence. And if we don't, chiropractic is going to be um, currently here in Australia, we have um, Medicare EPC program where a GP, a medical practitioner can allow a patient to have somewhere between one in five chiropractic visits a year covered by the national health care plan. Uh-huh. I would I could see a day where as if we don't change course, chiropractors will be working as employees in the national health care system and employees do not become wealthy. And once you become an employee, once you get into that system, you are a servant of the system. And anytime they want to say chiropractors, you're now going to practice this way. Chiropractors, you're now going to practice that way. Chiropractors, you're not allowed to do this. And chiropractors, you're not allowed to do that. Well, basically what we've done is we've taken a profession and turned it into a highly skilled occupational slot that works under the supervision of a medical practitioner. I think that may happen. Um, I think there will always be some renegade chiropractors who are fiercely independent, who have a very strong belief system. You know, I I think one of the issues we have is we've also de-emphasized the role of the, the, the chiropractic philosophical perspective. And so if we pigeonhole ourselves into low back, mechanical low back pain specialists or, or, or mechanical neck pain specialists, that's what we're going to get. You know, in, in life, you get what you tolerate. And so if we tolerate accepting second class citizenship, then that's what we're going to get. And so there are a few chiropractic colleges that are popped up around the, around the world that are trying to buck that trend. And and I have to share with you that I see people graduating from some of these colleges that love being a chiropractor, love doing what they're doing, understand this remarkable, almost unlimited potential that we have for unlocking health solutions via chiropractic care. Um, Those are the people I wanna have employed by me. Yeah. Those are the people I want in my practice. I think that the uh, older generation of chiropractor right now, they have to start thinking about um, business succession. You know, the, you can't keep hiring associates and keeping this personalized practice that, that fits only you and expect they're going to come and buy this one day and, buy, and, and also buy it at whatever price you think it's worth, depending on the country that you're in and the the region that you're in, there are accepted formulas, you know, like usual and customary formulas for valuing a practice. And, you know, people want to argue with me all the time. I, you know, I used to go around and and do do this for people and they used to argue with me all the time. No, my practice is worth this much. I said, no, it's not. It's worth what someone's willing to pay you. Yeah. You know, like people want to sell a house. I'm not selling it for that. My house is worth this much. Your house is only worth what someone's willing to pay you. And so there are things that we can do now with senior practitioners to help get their practice. Uh, By the way, Joe, and to your audience, the value of a practice is directly proportional to the amount of business systemization that has taken place in that practice, because you can't replace a charismatic person with somebody else. So the practice has to be all about business systems, not about a person's persona. And a lot of these guys have a hard time. When I say guys, I mean men and women, senior practitioners. In understanding that, look, this has been your own ego-driven, charismatic show for a while. But if you want to sell it, unless you can clone yourself, you're going to have to change this. You're going to have to create business systems that a new owner can see, ah, This profitable practice is run on systems so I can step in and continue the systems and continue this profitable 
regime that is takes place in this practice. So I think there's a lot of re-education that has to take place in our older practitioners. I think our younger practitioners really have to have a change in orientation of their mental, their mental processing their thoughts, their attitudes about business and money and finance and the profession as a whole. And then we have this group of doctors who are in the middle, like the mid-career doctors, and, and they're just getting it done and getting it done. They're going to be the ones that have to start making some changes now, A, to assist the younger ones to get up to speed, and B, to assist the older ones to transition out of practice. You know, we also have this incredible wealth of talent and knowledge in senior practitioners that we haven't tapped. Yeah. We should be using these senior practitioners in a mentoring role. See, I look at chiropractic practices. We have three phases in our career. You know, it's like the first bat, you know, chunk of your career is your apprenticeship phase. It's where you're learning how to be a chiropractor. Well, but I learned it in school. No, you didn't. You learn it in practice. So like this first block of time, is where you're putting your skill set together. That's your apprenticeship. Then we move into the, the leadership phase of your career where your skill set is developed, your business is functioning at a profit, and now you need to be an influential person in the profession and go back and serve in your associations, serve on committees, serve on disciplinary panels, serve all those things. Then we move to that last third of our career, which is the period of mentorship. And that's where like, look, whatever volume of practice you're doing, it's running profitably. You've learned your craft, you've mastered your craft. And now is your time to start giving back. And that's not just financially, it's giving back your time, your knowledge, your expertise, helping the younger ones to acquire that knowledge. If we don't pass on the knowledge, then it gets lost. Yep. Yep. And that's certainly my motivation for doing these videos. Um, Mark, I can only say that the Australian Chiropractic College is a place to be merely by your presence, but that would be excessive, right? Um, but I mean it. And in closing, I want to give you um, any last thoughts because you've given us a wealth of of information already to think about and so many of my guests have been people i just want back every week but uh, anything else to add mark okay chiropractic is not a spectator sport and so so i think everyone who's involved in chiropractic i mean in chiropractic we you know it's like it's like the big chiropractic bus either you're a driver or you're a passenger we need drivers we need everyone to put their hand up, every single chiropractor to put their hand up and say, hey, you know what? Whatever it is. Now, I notice uh, I love sports chiropractic. I want to be a sports chiropractor. Then goddamn, get involved in the organization, you know, in, in the clinical interest group and put your time in, put your hand up, serve on committees in chiropractic, attend every seminar. Well, if every single one of us, all 6,000 has to commit to personal excellence, mm. right? Just lift your game. Here's, all right, here's, here's, you know, I always tell the students, here's, this is so important. I need you to tattoo this on your butt so you never forget it. <laughs> in life, if you want more, you have to become more. Commit to becoming more. If every single chiropractor can just lift their game and get 10% better, that's, that's force multiplication. Without growing our numbers, we just grew our, our strength. And so everyone has to commit. You know, it's really easy to get complacent. Hell, you know, my, my practice ran really well. The systems ran well. It had a great staff. It was quite profitable. And it's so easy to, be, to become complacent. And so if it was easy for me, you know, this like anal retentive, you know, uh, person who like never sleeps, if it was easy for me to become complacent, I could imagine how easy it would be for everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, so support one of the chiropractic associations. I'm not telling you which one to do. I don't think select a clinical interest, whether pediatrics, neurology, sports, Jerry, I mean, pick them. There's a bunch of them and put your time in, put your time in, serve on those committees, work in those clinical interest areas, upgrade your skills, go for more qualification. 
get involved in, 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 in the politics of chiropractic. Everyone, every single chiropractor should be referring students to chiropractic school. Every single chiropractor should be adopting an existing chiropractic student and mentoring them. And by the way, if you're a chiropractic student listening to this, get away from negative people. You know, like if you find a negative chiropractor, just get the hell away from them. You know, if they're whining and bitching, let me tell you something else I learned. Successful people, right? Successful people, they don't bag their colleagues. And here's another thing I learned. Successful chiropractors. They're just successful people who chose chiropractic as their career. They would have been successful selling something. Oh, by the way, chiropractic's a business. You know what the number one business skill is? Not, not the number two, not the number three, number one business skill. And here's where everyone gets all pissed off and, and they're going to turn me off now. I'm about to just kill you. I'm about to destroy your ratings, Dr. Good, Joe. Good, good. The number one skill you need is salesmanship. You have to sell chiropractic to people. What do you think? People are born with a download that says chiropractic. Oh, yeah, we we downloaded this for you. Don't worry. Their their software package understands chiropractic is valuable. You need to sell the value of chiropractic. You need to sell yourself as a professional. You need to sell us chiropractic as, yeah, I know this may be different than anything you ever heard. But this stuff works brilliantly. Look at how chiropractic has overcome the odds for 125 years. For 125 years, we've been like lower than whale shit on the bottom of the ocean, and we're still surviving. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, you know, like things don't work. They're not around anymore. We're still there. We're still hanging in there. And remember, one of the big reasons, you know, know, we, we don't teach chiropractic history anymore. There are men and women chiropractors who went to jail for being chiropractors because they were they were charged with practicing medicine without a license. You know, because of my my age in chiropractic and the time when I went through my training and and everything else, I have met. I had the, the privilege of meeting chiropractors who went to jail for being chiropractors. Yeah. I mean, those are all war heroes. And, and, and the students today, what do they hear about? I mean, when these guys walked in the room, everyone stood, people stood up and clapped. People stood up and clapped when these people walked in the room, men and women, right? Women went to jail too. And they were, you know, a lot of them were given the option. Hey, don't do this or don't do that. And then they're like, well, no, I can't, I can't do that. That's not right. They'd walk in the room, the whole room stood up and clapped. People today don't even understand that. They think, oh, this is great. I can be a car. I see chiropractors driving BMWs. I can be one of them. I see chiropractors parading around like rock stars. I can be one of them. Oh, really? What do you think? They were born with that? You don't inherit a successful career. You build it. And you've got to, you, you got to bust your ass. Nothing comes for nothing. Well, Mark. I'm glad you came on today because you're when you're on, man, you're on. And I'm telling everyone out there that my friend and mentor, Mark Feldman, like nearly all of my speakers to this day, um, they live and breathe this stuff. Thank you, Mark Feldman, for living and breathing. Thank you. And everyone out there, this is a great profession. Get off your ass and get in the game. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, mate.